one of the problems we had in the case, uh, some of our counsel from Tennessee had the idea that the case was really about trying to enforce the Tennessee Constitution, trying to get the, to, trying to get the remedy to be that the United States Supreme Court would uh, enforce the uh, clear provisions of a state constitution that was violating our rights. And we had to keep him in our side and, uh, and keep his backing. But th that was not th the thrust of the argument. The, dumb, the basic argument was that the U.S. Constitution provided us a remedy that there was, to have equal protection of the laws, the right of having your vote counted on a basically uh, undiluted basis, or maybe an equal basis, or what have you, with the vote of the person in Dixon County or, or, in, or, or Houston County or whatnot, that it was not appropriate to have a cons constant, uh, deliberate uh, enhancement or, or dis uh, of a certain group, at the same time a disenfranchisement of those in the cities or those in East Tennessee. I will do what I can do, but you know, it's all up to Archie. Archie, of course, was Archibald Cox. We paraded down the hall to the Justice Department, and I'm going to tell you something. You got to go there like you've gone. I had, was overwhelmed. Magnificent place, magnificent office. Solicitor General Cox was waiting for us. He had two aides, uh, one of whom later became a federal judge in uh, Washington, D.C., and he was sitting there strumming through some papers just casually. And John Jay says, hey, Archie, I'm glad to see you, buddy. And he says, you know, he threw his feet up on the table like this. He says, ooh, they had these little offices back before we were in the campaign. Didn't we? This, is, this is really pretty nice, Archie. You're doing well. Well, I tell you, I want you to meet these guys from Nashville. They got a case that's really good. And uh, this, this case is solid, man. And I'm not going to say any more. And I want you to hear from them. Well, we spent two hours with him. We were scheduled for an hour, but he was obviously interested. I mean, you could tell the man, it, it appealed to his intellectual um, capabilities, and they were, they were vast. He, he asked these little questions like, well, tell me about something. I don't know about this. I knew good and well he, what he was doing. He was testing us. He wanted to see whether we were going to be straight with him, whether we were going to try to uh, put an awful lot of, gloss or shine on the thing or whether we're just going to tell it factually. He was a factual man and uh, he wanted to know what we thought the upsides, the downsides and we gave it to him. I, I spoke a few times but Osborne did most of the talking and Tommy is a, just, he's a very good talker but he's also had a good mind and he knew not, not to get into long oratorical flourishes which some, some of us, some lawyers do. <laughs> he, he told it straight. The United States government was not a party to this lawsuit. The Department of Justice had not been involved in it. But we felt that the weight of it, getting the Solicitor General to take up our cause would be extremely important because the Supreme Court will listen to the Solicitor General, in most cases, a lot quicker than he will to either our counsel from Washington or certainly not from us. Uh, lo and behold, Senator Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, who had written on this subject and who was well known for his article in the New York Times called The Shame of Our Cities on this very point on how the cities were being bankrupted and busted trying to give the services to people and could not get the money because the legislatures had not been reapportioned throughout the country. We took that uh, article and we showed it to uh, our Washington Council, he says, my gosh, you guys have really got a shot if you get, but let's wait and see. Well, Kennedy won. Uh, we went back to Mayor West. We said, we got to get an entree to see the Solicitor General. The entree was two people. John Siegenthaler, who became the uh, Deputy Secretary to Bobby Kennedy, the Attorney General of the United States, President Kennedy's brother. And John J. Hooker, who at that time was riding high.
So Earl Warren, who'd stayed quiet in both hearings, said, all of a sudden, what do these figures got to do? You've brought me tons of material up here. I'd brought a second set myself personally because the 1960 census had been completed and we had the figures for 60 and it was even worse than what we'd presented in our 50 figures. And I took them with me, on, took them myself on the plane. I carried about 40, 50 pounds of that stuff. And I took it to the Supreme Court clerk. And I'd always been told, if you don't know what to do, go see the clerk of the court. And I learned that in work in the General Sessions Court of Davidson County and in probate and so on. I always went to the clerk, clerk and master. We always liked to help young lawyers. I was young. I was at that time 29 or 30. I went to the U.S. Supreme Court clerk. I was scared. I said, what do I do? Do, I, do we have to file a motion to have these entered as a supplemental uh, set of figures or supplemental exhibits showing what has happened since the... He says, no. All you do is let me take care of it. I said, what? He says, I will put them up there, and, and you come help me. This was about an hour before they were supposed to be. We'll put them up on a desk, and the judges will have, each one will have these new sets of figures, new sets of data. They'll look at it if they want to. If they don't, they'll throw it in the wastebasket. He says, I think they won't be interested in this. I would be. I said, thank you. <laughs> Shut up and went on with him. <laughs> and he took me in there. We put them down. And when they came, they started looking at this stuff. They asked the question of Warren, what is this all about? And he says, these updated figures. We wanted you to have the current, the most current figures to look at. Okay. I got to argue the case. Uh, uh, after the case was over, it was remanded back to district court. And Mr. Osborne, uh, at that time, assumed the uh, representation of James Hoffa, who was being tried on a uh, criminal case here in Nashville. And he couldn't make it one day when the case was set for hearing. And I, I was designated to, to uh, make the argument that the newly passed act of the legislature was invalid. The legislature did make kind of a token, uh, small-time change, and it was patently uh, unconstitutional. And um, I got to argue it. And uh, Edwin Hunt had been hired by the state. By that time, the state of Tennessee decided it needed some outside scholarly outside representation from a scholarly standpoint. Mr. Hunt was a wonderful man and uh, he couldn't make it to the case. I think he became sick and the two people that argued it were, were myself and Gil Merritt. Gil was representing the uh, state of Tennessee. You asked a really good question. Would a young lawyer want to do it today? Uh, there are some uh, who will do it, uh, but the, the cost of practicing law is another big factor. I mean, you look at what it takes to run a, a law office, uh, the tremendous amount of pressure that's on you to participate in this organization, this organization, this civic charity, this operation, the debt that you have, the uh, uh, desires to be somebody, plus the competition level. Nashville today has, what, 2,500 lawyers? I don't know, 4,000? Shows you how far behind I am. Uh, 4,000 lawyers struggling to make a living in some respects. I, I, I did work a lot in General Sessions Court where I did the daily docket Learned a lot doing that. That was a great experience. I learned to pick up a file and try the case in 15 minutes. And I see today lawyers who spend maybe six months to a year of discovery before they can take on the case. I learned to really analyze, you know, whether you want to give this guy a break, whether the DUI first time you give him uh, probation maybe, or get, maybe change the reckless driving. Uh, you try to give a break to a guy the first time. Uh, you would try to give uh, justice that you could do, but you had to do it quickly. You didn't have time to sit there and really think it out. You had to move fast. You had to move or you, you would be overwhelmed. First place the judges in the General Sessions Court get pretty 
experienced themselves in this field. They, 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 know, they know the ropes and they know which one of these cases has merit and, and uh, they'd listen to you if you came in and said, I think uh, we've reached an agreement and the man wants to plead guilty and we'll take this and we recommend a sentence of this or no sentence, maybe a fine, goodness knows. But, you know, we didn't have the hard line, tough matters, once in a while assault and battery. You know, and what we've talked about brings to mind that really I had a lot more authority than I realized as a young person. Uh, today, we don't give that authority to young people in law firms. Uh, I, had, I had to make decisions and make them fairly quickly. I had to make, um, and this wasn't applicable just to General Sessions work, but other work I had in those days, you, you didn't have the ability to go through lengthy discovery, lengthy pleadings, and lengthy uh, trials. Uh, you had to do it, do your very best, and focus on it, and move on. And if you lost, you had to be gracious about it. Great, thank you. <laughs> well, there's a couple things. It seems that people have said they've sent me, and I need to look at. That's yeah. what the problem is. Yeah. Let me grab the, the U.S. Post Office runs the law practice. Yeah.